All right, having shared some of my favorite alternative diet and training theories in last week's April Fool's article, I want to do a quick video and talk about a couple of issues related to body weight. Um, since this is an issue, I want to make a quick disclaimer. Do not take this video as a suggestion to only use body weight as a measurement of anything. In every one of my books, I talk about the issue of losing weight versus losing fat, what body composition is, is discussed in detail on the main site, and I've linked to articles related to that. At the same time, people are going to use the scale. It does have some use in terms of tracking things, especially if you use it with another method, even a tape measure or a one-spot caliper measurement to track things. So use weight, but use it carefully. First thing I want to talk about is body mass index. Uh, the body mass index is an old measurement. It's a relationship of height to weight. Uh, in metric, it's uh, weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared, and you can use imperial measurements with a, um, with a conversion factor. Uh, BMI has been around forever, and it's been used as sort of a general indicator of health, body fatness, and there's a lot of controversy over it. Several weeks ago, my Facebook feed blew up with an article about a female, it was a military officer who was told, maybe a bodybuilder, was told by her nurse uh, to go on a diet because her BMI indicated that she was quote unquote overweight. Everybody lost their mind, said BMI sucked and needed to be thrown out, and I want to go on record as saying I don't think that's the case. BMI is a measure or an indicator of body fatness. The problem is that it's not meant to be used with trained athletes. The reality that people who are in the fitness field or work out a lot tend to forget is that the average heavy person is not heavy because they're muscular. Somebody who's 5'7 and 180 pounds, for example, will have a BMI that indicates that they are obese. Now, yes, an athlete may be lean and muscular. That athlete does not represent most people at that body weight. The problem with BMI is not that it's inaccurate. The problem is that it cannot be used for trained athletes. For everybody else, it's actually a pretty decent indicator with bo of body fat and actually shows a pretty good correlation with true body fat measurements. Um, in two of my books, links of course in the article, uh, I actually give a way to use body fat to, est uh, I'm sorry, to use BMI to estimate body fat percentage. But again, trained individuals can't use it. Okay, having discussed BMI, the next thing I want to talk about is weighing frequency. This was a topic that came up on the support forum, and I thought it was worth addressing. There's kind of two different attitudes about the idea of how frequently, if at all, to get on the scale. And again, I note that I don't recommend using the scale by itself. It really should be used with some other method to track results. On the one hand, there's actually pretty good research data, and this comes mainly from the National Weight Control Registry, which is a registry of successful weight loss uh, weight losers and maintainers, that one common habit is regular weighing. Um, their data, at least a few years ago, uh, found that 44% of members in the registry weighed themselves daily and 31% weighed themselves weekly. I think the idea here is that by jumping on the scale every so often, you can sort of keep track of where you are and catch yourself before you start to backslide. That is, we all kind of know there's that tendency to wear stretchy clothes and kind of ignore the scale and not take measurements because we want to pretend that the weight gain that we really know is happening isn't happening. So by getting on the scale every once in a while, you can sort of stop problems before they start and know when you need to get a little more serious about your food intake or your activity. At the other hand, there is this idea that getting on the scale too frequently can cause even more problems than it solves. And I don't disagree, but that has more to do with the way people tend to use frequent weighings. And what happens is people start to get really psychotic and pathological and obsessive about the scale and start adjusting what they're doing day to day or even within a given day based on these short-term kind of meaningless fluctuations. So from Monday to Tuesday, their weight will go up a couple pounds because they had a bunch of salt at dinner and they'll freak out and go do an extra hour of cardio and cut their calories way back. And then from Tuesday to Wednesday, there's, the weight will go back down and then it's time to celebrate, probably with a piece of cake. So what happens is they're using these short-term fluctuations that really don't mean anything and letting it drive them crazy and change their plan or change their daily eating and, and diet happens, uh, habits. And clearly that's a bad thing. Um, it is worth kind of noting in this regard, there's a, a study and I've, I've linked out to it below that was looking at the issue of the freshman 15 in female college students. And what they did uh, was they figured that by um, analyzing scale measurements over a seven-day span, they could kind of eliminate these 
uh, random fluctuations. And they gave the study subjects feedback uh, on their seven day, essentially as a rolling average, they're really, really doing a regression uh, equation with some heavy math that's not worth getting into. But it basically is a seven day rolling average. So what the researchers did is that every day the women would weigh and they would plug the new data uh, into the seven day rolling average. They dropped day one out and then add the new day seven and they just kept giving them feedback on that. And by giving them this feedback, the women who got the feedback basically avoided any weight gain over the 12 weeks of the study, whereas women who got no feedback gained anywhere from two to three kilograms. That's five to six pounds for the non-metrically inclined. So again, we've got this issue where weight gain and using that feedback usefully to sort of steer things on a week-to-week uh, -week basis can be useful, but if you're using it on an hour-to-hour -hour basis or a bowel movement-to-bowel -bowel movement basis to decide what you need to eat or what kind of activity you need to be doing, that's when it gets pathological. So weigh regularly, measure regularly, just don't get crazy about it. Okay, so recommendations. Uh, clearly, I do think that, that using the scale, especially if you're using it with some other kind of measurement, whether it's a tape measure for men usually thrown around the waist, women could be hips or thighs, could be a single caliper measurement, is not a bad idea just to keep track of where you're at. The question then becomes how often to do it, when to do it to get the best results. Those are all questions that I seem to, to come across consistently. Really, the best advice I can give is that whatever measurement method you decide to use, just be consistent about it. The worst thing you can really do is compare unlike to unlike. So if you're trying to compare Monday to Friday, where Monday you went out over the weekend and drank and ate a bunch of crap, and then weigh again on Friday, you're not going to get consistent comparative measurements. If you compare Friday to Friday or Monday to Monday, you're probably going to get measurements that are at least semi-comparable. I think it's worth mentioning that for women, even week-to-week -week measurements can really be thrown off by changes in water balance throughout the menstrual cycle. Women vary enormously in this regard. Some women can shift 10 pounds of water at different weeks of their cycle. Others see very little variance. That's an individual thing. But if you've got a woman who is really uh, sensitive to water weight gain during their cycle, comparing body weight in week one of the menstrual cycle to week three is just not going to give you useful measurements. They may have to even be comparing month to month. So they're comparing week one of January to week one of February and week two of January to week two of February to see any kind of reasonable, accurate measurements. Um, for the more mathematically or uh, technologically involved, you can set up a rolling average of your own an Alec Express, or maybe somebody who sees this can put together an Android or an iPhone app and actually do a regression equation like in the study I talked about. Uh, you basically just set it up so that every time you put in a new data point, it recalculates that average, and you can look at trends. So if the trend is going up, you're gaining weight, and if that's not your goal, you need to check something, either tighten down on your eating habits or increase your activity or both. If your weight's going down and that's not the goal, then you need to increase your food intake or decrease your activity. You get the idea. And the key with these measurements is don't let these short-term fluctuations drive you nuts. They're not telling you everything or anything for that matter. And make sure you compare them over reasonable time frames. But I do think they are useful to keep track of where you're at. Again, I want to reiterate that I don't think the scale by itself is terribly useful since it doesn't tell you what the composition of what you're gaining and losing is. But people are going to use it, and if you're going to use it, at least use it correctly. That's all I've got. Uh, if you want, uh, you can check out the article linked on my site for the various links to body mass index calculators, a couple of the, the resources I've mentioned. And if you want more information, come to my site, www.bodyrecomposition.com.